Hi, everybody. I'd like to introduce John Dopke. He's worked all over the world, speaks six languages, including Latin and Greek, and is an expert in complex payment systems. He's authored papers on uh, software process modeling for the ACM, and now he's the product manager for Adaptive Payments. Thank you, Mark. And in return, I would like to introduce Mark Elbert. Uh, Mark has been working for PayPal for five years, I believe and has had the distinction of managing and driving some of PayPal's most innovative products. He has, I believe, two patents pending, if I'm not mistaken. OK, good. And uh, Mark is the product manager for Adaptive Accounts. And the two of us are here to tell you a little bit about the Adaptive APIs. So take it away. Thank you. Welcome, and welcome back. Two years ago, at the first Innovate conference, we introduced Adaptive Payments. Last year, we returned to show you adaptive accounts and some of our first partnerships. Today, it's all about developers and entrepreneurs like you. We're going to invite some people on stage to talk about their companies and how their business models are enabled by PayPal's adaptive accounts and adaptive payments. Next. For those of you who are new to these tools, a little context. In order for merchants to receive payments with PayPal, they need to have an account. And for your consumers, having a PayPal account allows them to protect their financial information, check out faster, and of course, enable solutions like PayPal Access that you heard about this morning. Adaptive Accounts lets you create these accounts, and it lets you request appropriate permissions for managing them, and finally, lets you verify their status at PayPal. And meanwhile, on the payment side, Adaptive Payments is, not shockingly, an API that you use to do payments. Now, many of you, I'm sure, already know that PayPal has a number of different products that allow you to do payments, so let me tell you a little bit about what makes Adaptive Payments different. Adaptive Payments was revolutionary in that it opened up our payment functionality to you, to developers, who had all kinds of cool, crazy ideas about services to offer online and how you might be able to monetize those. Now, we recognize that if you want to monetize your idea, you need a lot of flexibility so you can experiment with different business models. Some of the features that AP is really known for are, for example, multi-party payments. A multi-party payment is pretty simple. It's a payment that has more than one recipient. Why would you want to do that? Well, suppose you run a marketplace and you match up buyers and sellers. And in exchange for the value you bring in matching up those buyers and sellers, you want to be able to take a cut of the transaction. With adaptive payments with a chain payment, you can have a transaction, the very transaction in which the buyer is paying the seller, you can also take a cut of that transaction directly. Now you're not in the business of having to bill the seller and trying to collect funds and so on. This gives you a lot of flexibility, and we'll hear from our partners a little later how they've used chain payments, which is one type of multi-party payment, to power their business idea. Second feature that's pretty salient is support for different hardware and software platforms. We all know that the internet isn't just about the PC anymore, and neither it's the same is true for payments. So now, with adaptive payments, we really built AP to enable payments not just on PCs, but also on televisions, on kiosks, on game consoles. Um, I think the paying on the refrigerator example is probably a little old now. Uh, I'm going to skip that one, and let's say uh, paying in your car. Uh, there are a million different ideas you could think of about where to enable payments, and Adaptive Payments was built to support that kind of use case. And finally, flexible configuration options. There are a million little things I could tell you about here. I'll just focus on a couple. One is a pre-approval. So suppose you want to do a recurring payment or a sporadic payment with a user, and you don't want them to have to approve every single time. What you can do is set up a pre-approval with that user, and that way the user approves just once that you can spend up to $100 against their account, and then they don't have to approve the specific transactions. This is great for uh, gaming or other contexts in which you want the user to stay in context at the point where the transaction actually happens. 
And another example I'll give here is the flexibility in how fees are distributed. Since we've got these multi-party payments, when you've got multiple recipients, you may need to try different ways of deciding who pays the fees for that, if it's split proportionally or, or what. And again, this is one of the kinds of points of flexibility that we found uh, developers really need so that they can experiment. If the one business model isn't quite right, they can change that. And you'll hear from one of our partners that this is something that they needed to be able to just settle on just the right business model to succeed. Adaptive's embedded flows make it unique among our uh, among PayPal solutions. They let your customers access PayPal at your site, keeping your customers where they belong. Adaptive Payments offers fast and simple checkout directly within your site in a light box. And Adaptive Accounts offers the same experience in a mini browser, allowing them to open accounts on your website and never leave your flow. Your customers will never have to leave your site and fall down a rabbit hole somewhere at PayPal. Great. Um, right. So, as Mark mentioned, we introduced adaptive payments a couple of years ago and adaptive accounts last year. I wanted to give you a, just a broad idea of who's using this. I will not read every bullet on that slide, I promise you. But uh, what, it's been really heartening to see all the different people who've picked up adaptive payments and adaptive accounts and done really cool things with them. I've already talked a little bit about the marketplace idea. Uh, there's a number of marketplaces who use some of the features in AP. There's a number of non-retail kinds of use cases like payouts, also things like digital goods can use adaptive, pay adaptive payments. Financial institutions actually have really interesting and unique needs for both for creating accounts and for executing different kinds of payments. And we've seen some really interesting use of that with financial institutions. Hardware, software platforms I've talked about, and mobile as well. PayPal has a number of products that are designated specifically for mobile, but often in order to create a full solution for mobile, it's not just the payment piece. It often involves creating the account, and adaptive accounts winds up being a key piece of that. So it's a really broad kind of range of things that we've seen. And ultimately, Again, we've built this in a way that's supposed to be flexible to handle all those use cases and more for innovators, right? For people who have their own idea of what they want to do and they need the flexibility to be able to experiment so they get it just right. Now, we've said that that was just a little context. We want to be able to focus on the partners who've done really cool things. We have a couple of companies here with us today. Um, the first, I'd like to introduce the CEO of a company called Zipments. One thing that I like about these two companies, by the way, is that even though they're very entrepreneurial and, and kind of they seem a lot like Silicon Valley companies, they're in fact not here. And so the first, Zipments, is based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I myself am from Chicago, so I always love to welcome a fellow Midwesterner. And and uh, for those of you who don't know where Grand Rapids is, you know that Michigan is shaped like that, like a hand. So anytime you meet someone from Michigan, you can kind of go, okay, well, um, Grand Rapids is kind of here. I think I got that right. Eh, yeah, okay. So um, without further ado, let's welcome Garrick Pohl, who's the CEO of President of Zipman's. Thanks, John. Sure. You can uh, just hit the right pair. Right, all right. Perfect. Good afternoon. Uh, when Mark and John reached out to me and asked to join them today, I said, guys, I, I'm not the technical guy on my team. I have no idea how to explain all of these wonderful things that you've given us to use. And, and they, they, as they said earlier, they wanted to highlight how we're actually using it. And, uh, and so as I started to think about that, um, I, I quickly told them that at the end of the day, what I really was drawn to with PayPal is options, and as any startup knows, you go into any project and you really don't know what you're trying to accomplish sometimes, so you need options, and that's one of the things that I absolutely love about uh, AA and AP, and I hope to, I guess, leave you with that message today. Um, I would imagine that the majority of us in this room are either involved in a new project or, like me, in a new company. And um, you know, by nature, we're typically cutting against the grain, and we typically hear a lot of, from naysayers saying, oh, that's just crazy, you can't, you can't do that. How gratifying it was this morning to listen to the keynote address and realize that I'm not alone in my fight. I've got an entire ecosystem of partnerships and tools available uh, that I think are really going to help Zipman's uh, uh, take off in the next couple of years. So I hopefully, uh, hopefully the rest of you kind of left that keynote address feeling the same way. And again, that's one of the reasons why we work with PayPal, because it provides us options, but it also provides us partnerships and tools that we're going to need as we scale our business. 
where do I aim this at, John? Oh, there we go. See, I told you I'm not a technical guy. <laughs> So, um, you know, it, the, the problem that we are tackling is, again, a little repetitive from the keynote address, which is what really energized me today when I hear some of the leaders in the industry talking about the pain points they're addressing. And I'm saying, boy, we're doing the same thing in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing. Fifteen years have gone by since the retailers first put on some sort of online uh, marketplace presence. And 15 years later, just this past holiday season in 2010, it was the first time that we actually saw major retailers promoting the idea of buying items online and picking up the same day in their brick and mortar stores. And, and that's great. That's perfect timing for companies like Zipman's because what we're trying to do is provide you the same gratification that you get when you're shopping brick and mortar, but the same convenience that you get when you're, when you're shopping online. And so that's what we're all about. As I mentioned, you know, the, a lot of times we'll hear from naysayers uh, who will say, what are you trying to accomplish here? Like many of you, I don't see the, uh, the world as it is, I see it as it should be. And so the problems that we're trying to solve are not necessarily to address the world today, but the world that we'd like to create for tomorrow. And I look at some of these examples here and I think to myself, how crazy is it that we all go to Walgreens to get medicine when we're sick? I mean, who wants to hang out with sick people at the store? I mean, I'd much rather send somebody healthy to get my medicine and let me stay at home and recuperate. Um, when I think about shopping experience in general, I mean, everywhere across the country, we have acres and acres of asphalt surrounding these stores. Why? Because we all show up to the store to pick up items, and then we all go back to our homes or our offices uh, with those items. Why can't just a few of us get those items so the rest of us can go about our day? Think about the environmental benefits of being able to reduce the footprint of those parking lots or the transportation, uh, the environmental impact of us all driving uh, to those locations. So I kind of see the world maybe a little bit differently, and again, I'm, I'm excited to hear that from the the leaders of the industry, they see the same things. So what is this all about? So obviously we have some pain points here. We want immediacy, we want convenience, and what Zipmints is really designed to do is to provide that through kind of a crowdsourcing delivery model. And so what we're doing in Grand Rapids, Michigan, we also have uh, some presence in LA, Chicago, New York, and we're expanding is to, to find folks who are willing to provide same-day delivery services from businesses to individuals who shop at those businesses. So this is just an example of one person who can make some pretty good money at a time when our economy is really struggling. Many of us are finding it difficult to find uh, uh, solid employment. Many of us are doing contract work. Many of us are starting our own businesses. And what Zipmints is really designed to do is provide those types of solutions to people who want to work on their own time, their own terms, and, and add value to our, to our economy. So that's what we're all about um, and we're seeing some really good traction where we need to really go is to tie in better with a lot of the retailers where we know the shopping experience starts so again looking at some of the things that are coming out uh, we're excited to be a part of this entire ecosystem uh, as John said earlier, we're kind of a transaction-based model, too. We get a little bit on a transaction, so we need a lot of transactions. This is just a quick overview of how it works. Essentially, if I'm someone who wants to buy something from a retailer, and this could be a big box retailer, this could be your local mom and pop store. Um, I shoot out an assignment to the Zipman's Marketplace, and uh, through a competitive bidding process, I'm, in, I'm guaranteed to get a very low cost for, for items that I need delivered. Uh, I use it all the time. In fact, my deliveries don't always go to home or the office. Sometimes on a Saturday afternoon, they go to the soccer field because that's where I am watching my kids play. So if I need groceries delivered, guess what? They go to the soccer field. Um, and so using adaptive payments has been very helpful for us in doing some of those chain and uh, split transactions that John and Mark talked about. I'm just going to walk very quickly through why we chose uh, PayPal. Um, first of all, as John said earlier, um, you know, when we started out, we really didn't even know what, it, what was our price points, who's going to be interested in this. And so we didn't know, are these transactions $2, $10, anything in between? So we love the flexibility of the micropayment versus standard payment options. It allows us to continue to explore and experiment with what exactly our revenue model is. Secondly, uh, it provides a level of verification for our couriers. All of our couriers have to have verified PayPal accounts. It's just one layer to verify who these couriers are, and it's been very helpful uh, in making sure that we've got quality couriers in the marketplace. 
It's a great solution for delayed chain payments. So the way it works is after the job is done, 24 hours go by, there's a kind of a grace period to make sure that these, um, these uh, transactions went through smoothly, and then the courier receives their money. The couriers love that because a, a typical courier is on like a two-week two or four-week invoicing process. So to get their money 24 hours is late, uh, later is great. Uh, one of the things I mentioned to Mark and John, again, this is through our experimentation, we love the ability to shift our fees. So originally we had the couriers bear their own PayPal fees. And over time we realized actually our couriers are really good at not just delivering items, but actually purchasing the items on the consumer's behalf and then getting reimbursed through PayPal. So we didn't want them to have to carry the heavy burden of, of fees on items that they're not purchasing for themselves. So we've taken those fees off of their shoulders and put it on ours, but it was an adjustment that we were able to make on the fly, which is great. Uh, smooth transition during the registration process. As many of you know, the last thing you want is any sort of abandonment rate when you're trying to sign up users. And so one of the things that's great about the adaptive payment process is it's very smooth. It allows us to elegantly go between our portals and PayPal and back again. We love that. And then finally, it gives us a great way to have various forms of payment. You can do a guest payment, you can link your debit and credit card, and what I love most is the pre-approval. Once I've decided I'm a fan of Zipmints, I don't want to hassle with having to go through the payment process every time, so I just approve uh, Zipmints to charge my card, and it's a one-click type of purchase and I'm done. So I could go on and on about what we love about PayPal as it is today. I'm very excited about what's coming up, and so that's, that's kind of our company in a nutshell and why we've chose to work with these guys. Well, thank you, Derek. It's, it's, it's always nice to have you go on and on about how you like PayPal. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to do that anytime. So our next speaker is from further abroad. And as it happens, we're compatriots. Um, Canada's a little too big for me to use my hand to tell you where he's from, but suffice to say he's from the West Coast. Daryl's been in the software industry for over 30 years and has founded more startups than I can count. And he's the CEO of Fundraiser, and he's here to tell us today about how, that, how PayPal's worked for him. Thanks, Mark. So where are we at here? So I'm Daryl Hatton, I'm founder and CEO of Fundraiser. Fundraiser is an innovative um, application for using social media to help raise money for local, individual, or group causes. Long time ago when you used to raise money, you'd go out to your community and you'd pass around a hat saying, hey, help us out, we're trying to raise money for this type of cause. Because our communities were where we hung out, the marketplace, the school, the, uh, uh, the church, etc. Now what we're doing is our communities are moving online to social media. And so fundraiser, we created Fundraiser as a way of passing your hat using social media to reach out to your online community and collect the money for the causes that you need. Now most people think of fundraising as charities and political campaigns. But one of the great things about the innovations that have happened with social media is that we can raise money from a crowd for any type of cause now. Could be an individual cause, could be a cause specifically for things like school groups or sport teams or church groups, as well as the charities and nonprofits. And this is an area that we're focusing on. One of the reasons we're focusing on it is that our technology has an innovation that helps make it easy for a school to authorize someone like a parent to help raise money for a cause within the school using crowdfunding technology. Give you an example of that. So Anna has been asked by the school to help raise money for the soccer team to go to championships in Florida. What she does is she can go to the website for the school, mock up in this case, and hit to the fundraising tab. And from there, she'll see campaigns that other parents in the schools might be running to raise money for school projects. She's, she can take a look through and see what kind of things are working from other parents. And when she's ready, she goes ahead and creates her own campaign. She's told a little bit about how to create it, what she needs to do to make a campaign success, successful in social media. And then she's taken through to a place where she designs her own campaign. So this is our campaign designer that's running inside the school's website. And the great thing about modern web technology is we can add all of this social media functionality, campaign management functionality, to a site with a couple of lines of script code. So she goes and she adds a title to her campaign, talks about why she's raising money, puts in a photo of the team, and adds a video clip that might be the kids saying, hey, we're really excited to go, you know, grandma, help me out kind of thing. 
When she's ready, she updates that campaign and it's sent off to the school for approval by email and then when it's approved, it's published automatically to the website. Now when someone comes to the website for the school, they see one of these campaigns and if they hover over it, it's very important. They get a message from Anna saying, hey, help me out. This is about community and about local. If somebody clicks on that, we load the entire social media fundraising campaign right over top of the, of the school's website as a light box environment. And someone can see the campaign, they can view the video clip, all that kind of thing. But very important, they can see who else in the community has already donated and the, cause, the, the messages of support that have come from them. Now if somebody interacts with the campaign, this is where we start getting into the PayPal aspect and one of the reasons why we chose PayPal. See here, we tell them they're going to pay with PayPal, which means they can be a guest and pay with a credit card or they can pay with their PayPal account. And we open up that embedded payments experience that we were talking about earlier. Allow them to log in straight over the, the school's website. This helps create a sense of trust that they're involved in something that's real. It's not being taken off to some strange place on the web to make a payment. They start, sign in with their PayPal account. And as you see here, it's a little hard to see, but the payment is going to Fundraiser High School in this case, not to Anna. So she's managing the campaign on behalf of the school. When this payment is complete, the donor is asked to give some sort of comment to support, again, encouraging others to make a donation. If we need to, we'll collect the tax receipt information if it was a taxable type transaction. And then one of the most important things, we ask the donor to help share this campaign and social media to their friends and their networks. One of our innovations is that when this campaign is shared on Facebook, for example, the news feed, it looks like a video clip. When we see video clips on Facebook, we tend to play them. But if somebody plays that, it doesn't run a video clip. It runs our application right in the news feed. So someone can see, again, all the details of the campaign, and very important, they can start a transaction right from the point where they first looked at the campaign. The point of all this was to try and reduce the friction involved in sharing a campaign, in helping people communicate their need, and in helping people collect the payments at the time when a donor feels motivated to do it. So why did we pick PayPal? If you think about our target user base and our target customer base, many of the, um, them are are very technically unsophisticated. They're not looking to spend a lot of time trying to learn about our product and how to make it work. It has to be very simple. The PayPal experience on the payment side definitely helped us with that. If you think about the type of customers we have, things like sport teams and some PTAs and that, that don't have uh, accounts already created for them, they're never gonna qualify for a merchant account. So the fact that PayPal will allow us to collect money for those groups, with those groups, and the onboarding process for signing up for an account like that really reduced the friction in helping us acquire new customers. Take a look at the business model we have. We're using, again, this chain payments idea. And it's very important for us, when the money goes from a donor directly to the recipient, it's not being aggregated into our account. It goes directly into their account. But at the same time, our fees are instantly deducted and the fees for PayPal are instantly deducted. To me, this matters two ways. It reduces the risk from our customer's point of view. They feel more comfortable having the money go directly to them. Second thing is from a merchant's point of view, if there's a, a problem with the donor, they don't want to actually have made that payment or some fraud, the recipient's responsible for this, not me. I don't have to take on the risk, the financial risk for that transaction. Key thing for us was the ability to have the technology that would work within the social networking platforms. This embedded payment flow is quite difficult to get to run anything other than PayPal technology within Facebook. So it was key that it, to, to have this market opportunity, we had to have technology that would run inside the Facebook environment. And as a partner, fundraising is a global activity. Our customers need to do this all over the world. We were looking for one partner that would let us transact in almost any of the Western countries. Almost from the day we launched, we had customers coming on board unsolicited from the UK, from Western Europe, from Australia and New Zealand. So a great way to reach out to a global market almost instantly on launch. You heard today in the keynote about how much the pace of innovation is picking up. And that's very important to us as well in our industry. Both the crowdfunding side is very innovative and the payments industry side. 
We needed a partner that could keep up with this, but wasn't just a point solution. Customers needed to feel comfortable that they were dealing with something that had some stability. All the cool tech doesn't necessarily help when you have a somewhat reluctant base of transactors. We needed something that was available across traditional web, social web, and mobile web, and that's available through PayPal. And it's a startup. I think you're all aware of this. We're all small. We don't have a ton of technical resources. It was incredibly important that this was easy to do. Tech talent is expensive. I want them focused on developing our customers' experience rather than implementing infrastructure technology. Finally, I think some of the great things that are happening with the X.Commerce platform is that we've been focused on gift collection so far. The, the platform will help us move into being able to offer ticket sales and fee collection and sales of products that will help fund these different types of projects from our target customer base. And again, with some of this stuff in the payments platform, paying it now, paying it later, or paying, paying it on a recurring basis. If there's one thing I can, I'd kind of like to make different, small startups are risky. We know that we're not the, necessarily the best customers because right off the bat we don't have huge volumes to prove the worth of working with us. I think one of the great things about the PayPal partnership we've had, and it's been a partnership, they're very interested in helping us use their technology to succeed, to understand it, to implement it in the best possible ways. And this has really helped us build our business and help go through some of the changes we've had to do as we go along through this business. I said earlier, options. There's tons of options in this partnership. So I highly recommend it. So if you like, check out Fundraiser, fundraiser.com, and I'll be here for questions after. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, once again, I'd just like to thank both of our partners, Garrick and Daryl, for their, the information that they shared. I hope you've gotten a good flavor for what kinds of things that developers are out there doing with adaptive accounts and with adaptive payments. And at this time, I'd like to open it up for any questions you may have. I know that uh, folks may have been uh, tweeting questions to the X, uh, pound XPay hashtag, um, but if anyone has any questions, go for it. Yes. So the question was, what's the difference between a pre-approval and adaptive payments and recurring payments, which is part of website payment standard? Uh, there's a couple answers to the parts of that answer. One is with pre-approvals and adaptive payments, it's not about, it doesn't do the recurring payments for you. It lets you decide when you do the actual transactions. So with a pre-approval and adaptive payments, step one is you establish a pre-approval with, with the buyer, and they go through a flow in which they say, yes, I'm a, they log in, and then they say, yes, I, I, I approve this. And then in, in the future, then you call back to PayPal when it's time to do the actual transactions against it. With recurring payments, it's great if you know you want to do this every single single week, the same amount, whatever. But in the case of something where it may be sporadic, um, for example, in, in Garrick's case where you want to set up a pre-approval but you don't know when the next transaction will be or for how much, then pre-approval winds up being a really good solution. Yes? So, so the question is, in a mobile web app, how does that light box get displayed? So the light box is something that we haven't enabled on the mobile uh, screen yet. What's interesting, though, is that the form factor is pretty similar. So there has been some discussion of could we enable that. So right now, the light box for adaptive payments is, doesn't appear on mobile, and that's the same for adaptive right. accounts. It's the same for adaptive accounts, um, but it is definitely a focus for the, the near future to build that out. So question is, would the lightbox make sense or, yeah. Well, what's existing? What's well, existing, okay. So actually, a, a better answer there is um, not the topic of this presentation, but Mobile Express Checkout is, has been a phenomenally successful pro uh, product over the last year. And I know that there are many folks from the mobile team here, uh, I can introduce you, uh, but that checkout experience is definitely designed for the mobile browser and, and it works a treat. It's really I, yeah, really I believe there was a whole session on mobile. I, I haven't looked in detail Indeed, at the schedule, yes, but um, it, that would be a great question just I to find out team, what so direction are they going. So, yeah, question. 
Disputes. How do we handle disputes was the question. Um, disputes with adaptive payments are handled in the same way that they're handled with any of our other payment flows. So at the time of payment, adaptive payments takes over and manages the, the flow of money. If somebody wants to lodge a dispute, then they come to PayPal in the usual way and they open a dispute. Now, what's different in adaptive payments with disputes is because it's a multi-party transaction, that's the one thing that might change the way a dispute happens. And the way that we've set it up, and this was based on a lot of feedback that we got from a number of our customers was the dispute only governs the first what we call a payment leg of a transaction. So in a chained payment, this is the type that both of these guys were talking about. You've got a sender who sends money to a primary recipient and then some portion of that money goes on to a secondary recipient. If the buyer opens a dispute, that governs only the money that moved from the buyer to the primary recipient. Now, if the primary and the secondary want to work out whether that second leg needs to be rolled back in the case of a dispute or whatever, that's, that would be up to them separately. Not the marketplace or whatever. Typically, yes, although it's really up to the developer, and, and that choice actually has a few ramifications. So in a chain payment, what the buyer sees is they're, buy, they're paying the primary. They don't see what happens behind that. In some cases, because of that, what you want is for the courier, in, in, in Garrick's example, and the, the, person, so the recipient of the donation to be the primary, because that's what you want the buyer to see. But sometimes you want a marketplace where the marketplace is the primary because the marketplace is trying to aggregate across multiple sellers, for example, or something like that. So there are use cases where you see the marketplace as the primary and then a seller or multiple sellers are the secondary. It just depends on what you're trying to do uh, and what you want the buyer's experience to look like. Uh, yes, question, and then you. Question for you on uh, when I'm also Correct. They used to, but they don't anymore, right? Okay. Right. In adaptive payments, though, they do pay. So this is the the peer to peer, the person to person payments. And, and there's no goods being given, like in, in the case of the charity situation, someone's giving money in return for nothing. Right. And they're getting billed at now the the, the person getting the funds is going to get billed at the max amount, mm -hmm. not a micro payments account. Right. They don't have a micro payments account, most likely. Right. You know what I mean? So you're going to hit them with 2.930 cents per transaction. The cut that you take out is 4.95 percent or whatever you grab. You're going to, you're going to, that's that goes under the micropayments type of thing. But the overall fee is quite large. Why is there a difference? It seems like there's there's not a there's not like a, a uniform idea on what a gift is across your company. It right. seems like when we do it one way, and, and that brings up another thing is that now we're dealing, it's developer against platform, which should never be the case. So it's almost like the people bypassed you, they could get a better deal. Well, so, like, yeah, you threw a bunch of things at me, so let me back up for a minute. Right. So the the initial question was, um, you know, when it comes to like, um, when it comes to person to person payments. Um, Right now, it's true. If you go on the website and I just wanted to send you money, then that would be a free transaction in most countries, by the way. Right. Um, now, in the case of person-to-person uh, -person payments and adaptive payments, right now it's not free. Um, I don't know if there's been any discussion of changing that. I would have to talk to some other folks about that. Uh, I'd be interested to, to, in hearing a little bit more about the use case. But it's but it you there are. So with the person to person payments, one thing to remember is it's free if it's bank or balance funded. There is, there's always a fee when there's a credit card just because we obviously have direct costs that we have to manage and so on. Um, and in addition, when you start to get into person to person payments in a chained payment scenario, it also gets more complicated in terms of do you put fees here or not. And so like, I don't have a blanket answer for you. I would love to just to talk about like what would be a better solution for that. In terms of the micropayments, um, the, the, the fees that get paid depend on the, the fees that are attached to a given PayPal account. So if they have standard fees, then that would be the fee that would be assessed. Now, if there are different price categories, as you pointed out, so at least the portion that you collect, you could, you could get on that. But again, I think 
if, if it turns out there's a use case that we could do better like that, I would, I would love to hear about it and see, okay, well, how could we equalize that with some of the other kinds of products that we have? So it's a good point I'd be happy to talk about. It. Yes? Sure. So the question was, how, how does couponing kind of intersect with, especially sounded like chained or other kinds of multi-party payments? Um, I don't know that I have a blanket answer for that. I think the best way to say it is that the API caller who sets up the payment, who calls adaptive payments to decide who the parties are, can decide exactly how much money goes to each recipient. So let's say that the, the API caller wanted to apply a coupon to decrease the amount that one party is receiving without changing the amounts that the other parties receive. That's just a matter of setting the parameters right when you make the call. So when you make the call, you just lay out who are the recipients by email address and how much each person receives. That way, since it's just strictly amounts, you can decide exactly if there's a coupon in the mix, then who, you know, which amount gets decremented and which ones don't. So you have, did, did I answer your question? Yes, yeah, so I think what you're saying is there has to be one decider. Yes. Makes yes. Yeah. Yeah. For that and for any of the questions of how the payment is structured, it's like it, it all comes down to the way the API caller calls uh, adaptive payments. Yep. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, adaptive payments, I believe, supports. There was one currency. No, that's one still coming on board. Yeah, we support all the, the currencies that PayPal supports today. There is no. And, we yes. do support Brazil. Obviously, there are currency restrictions uh, around Brazil, who can receive uh, reais. And um, so, for example, let's say I'm a merchant in uh, the UK, I don't know, um, and I want to sell in Brazil. Uh, the merchant cannot receive reais directly, but as long as they're willing to uh, have PayPal do a currency conversion as part of the transaction, then that transaction will go through. And so the customer will, be see, will see that they're paying in reais, and it doesn't really matter that the, the, the seller would receive it in pounds or dollars or whatever they want. So, yeah. And, and that's pretty standard across all the PayPal products. The only twist with a multi-party payment is it has to be the same transaction for, for the whole um, for the whole transaction. So you can't have one leg that's being transacted in pounds and something else in a different currency. It has to be uniform. And to the broader question, uh, PayPal supports nearly every country in the world and nearly every currency in the world. Um, and we have an office in Brazil and, and are launching quite a number of interesting integrations and, 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 uh, and customers down there. Other questions, comments? Yes? Are you referring to as a courier? What type of PayPal account? Um, yeah, so what's the yeah. account they have to have Right, right. So in the case of both uh, Zipments and the courier, it's a, it's a verified uh, business account. Uh, so that's one of the things that we check for, and we were having conversations last night about that in terms of making sure through the registration process. I mean, in most cases, people who are coming to us uh, to register as couriers already have PayPal accounts, but many of them haven't upgraded to a business account or a verified account. And so that's where we're, we're always putting our focus, is making sure that there's no confusion there and that there's no you know, uh, drop off in registration, just because now you know, this might be the first time they've been hit with the scenario where their PayPal account that they've been using for years is no longer sufficient. And so, and it's been, it's worked out really well for us, but, um, you know, there's always things that we can do to make it a little bit easier. Uh, we look at it like it's one more thing to kind of move people towards a professional occupation versus just kind of an ad hoc, okay, I'll do this drop off one time. That's really not what we're trying to foster in our marketplace. And so, you know, we kind of like some of these restrictions that we have. At, at a high level, uh, just to answer that question further, there are three types of accounts at PayPal, personal, premier, and business. And the one that 
I guess is the least capable is personal. Premier and business can both do nearly everything at PayPal. Um, and, and, and this is mostly when it comes to receiving money. If you're going to be selling things, um, certain things aren't going to be possible with a personal account. And so uh, if you want to set up access to use these APIs, uh, you'll need a Premier or a business account in order to be able to use them. And, um, and there's a process for getting a, an, an API caller ID so that you can use these in a vetting process and so forth. Uh, and then for your customers, if they're receiving money, it's probably best to push them towards Premier or business uh, as sellers. But certainly as consumers, any of those accounts are fine, and most likely they'll be personal customers. Yeah, and just to speak a little more on the whole vetting, one thing we didn't speak too much about is with both adaptive accounts and adaptive payments, we have a process of vetting in which if you want to develop an, a, an application using these APIs, you can do all your development on your own in the sandbox, and that's fine. When it, when it comes time to go live, you need to have a PayPal business account, and then you just submit a form that's on x.com that explains what your application is about, what specific capabilities you need, and so on. We then go through a review process just to make sure it's kind of like submitting an app to the App Store for Android or, or Apple. And we just do a simple review on that. Um, we're a lot nicer than Apple is about that. And uh, I didn't just say that, by the way. Um, and then um, and then we'll give you an app ID. And then from then on, that app ID has the right permissions associated with the capabilities that you asked for. But you just need a PayPal business account in order to do that part of the process. So. Other questions? Comments, jokes, yes? So the question was, um, when, we do, when we use adaptive payments, does the merchant need to store the credit card number in case of a credit card payment? The answer is no. Um, adaptive payments, like any of our hosted flows, are fully PCI compliant, so you don't have to be. So, in, so the, and the, the issue here, for those who may not be familiar, is that anybody, but according to the rules of Visa and MasterCard and so forth, anytime you're handling credit card numbers, you have to handle them in a very specific way. You have to encrypt them and store them in a database, and you have to get certified and audited and, and all this stuff. If you're using a hosted flow like adaptive accounts, and by hosted I mean that all of this information is changing hands on PayPal.com, then you don't worry about any of that. You don't get the credit card number, the buyer's information is shielded, and and for the merchant, they don't have to worry about any of this PCI compliance business. So that's a big deal. You, you mind if I just uh, follow up on that, John? That's one of the things. Uh, in my old business, we did go through PCI compliance. And then with this one, the first thing we said was, no, we're going to let PayPal handle that. And for anybody out there who thinks that that's kind of just a footnote in your, in your, in your plan, it's not. So never underestimate that. And, and after, after all, I mean, what we're all trying to do is get our products and services to market. We're not trying to create better payment solutions. And so um, I would just be a big advocate as you kind of look through the requirements there not to just skip over PCI compliance and think it's something that you can handle. Um, let these guys handle it. They do a great job of it. Okay. Uh, yes, question here. I am not the reigning expert on that. Um, so the question was, is it, do you have to do the PCI components if you handle or only if you store? Answer is, I, I, I'm not the best expert on it. Mark, I don't know if you happen to know the answer to that. I, I can't recall specifically for gateway products like that where you're simply transitioning it from the web page to an API. Um, there is a, there is a, a talk uh, later uh, with uh, Dan Garcia and... Uh, yeah. I forget the other guy's name, uh, but they talk a lot about their product uh, around that, and they would certainly be the experts in answering that question. And uh, can question? we can certainly talk afterwards too. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a question here and then there, yeah. Uh, this is a question for Darrow. Um, you mentioned specifically you didn't, like your fundraiser managers didn't need to create a business account from that. Like, that's, I don't know, like, it seems fundamentally different from what uh, you had mentioned in terms of your couriers having a portion of the 
So the question is about uh, that we don't, uh, what type of account do we require our customers to have? If you're raising for a personal cause, then you have to have a premier account. If you're raising for, on behalf of like an organization like a school, then the school has to have a business account in the name of the school. As Mark mentioned earlier, the premier and business accounts are pretty similar in terms of what we allow. The main difference is that a premier account is typically still tied to an individual in terms of who's the owner, whereas a business account is more commonly on behalf of an organization. Um, so from a kind of a legal compliance level, that's which you guys don't have to deal with, but this is kind of the way we think of it, uh, is that the, the organization is the recipient in the case of a business account. So what you just said would be very much in line with that. Absolutely. And, and I think in general, a business account can be an individual as well, but it's usually an individual as a business, uh, whereas right. a premier account is better suited to individuals who occasionally make, take some money in. Right. There was a question over here somewhere, I believe. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes? Is there a limit for the number of times, like the number of different ways a single payment? I believe it's currently six recipients, but I think I heard that some people were asking for more. So uh, if it turns out you have a use case where it needs to be more than that, I'd be interested to hear it. Um, there are a couple other products where we do that. Uh, MassPay would be one product where we allow a lot more, I think it's up to 250 or something like that. Um, so we've got a couple different solutions to handle that. And there's a distinction between parallel and chained payments there too. So there can only be two chain destinations, That's but they true. can be up to six. So um, in a, ch a parallel payment, a parallel payment, I'm doing this with my hands, I know, but uh, a parallel payment is where you have one sender and there's multiple recipients without an intermediary. Uh, a chained payment is when you have, to, you have a sender, a primary, and then multiple. Um, we only allow two legs, two different payment legs, but how much it actually fans out, that gets into the six, I think it's six recipients. If you look at the API, they're named receiver one, receiver two, down up to six, so that is pretty much your answer. <laughs> and I'll also answer the question about a different PayPal product. Express Checkout allows up to 10 uh, parallel payments. Okay. Uh, right. So I, I think AP can probably be extended if you need it to be. I think it's configurable, but you yeah. know, if that's currently what you're after, EC has that up okay. to 10. I believe we're at the end if of the Express Checkout, that is. time for the session. I should check that. Hmm. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd invite any of you who have for any further questions to come and chat with us afterwards. Uh, and otherwise, I would like to thank you for coming to this session. I hope you've uh, enjoyed this and enjoy the rest of the show.